Our next speaker is Baptiste Poutier, who's in his third year of a PhD at NXP, semiconductors in Inra in France. He's working with voice and audio uh, team that develops voice and audio centered applications on NXP devices. Welcome, Baptiste. Thank you. Oh, you don't. Thank you, everybody. You can hear me well? Yeah. Okay. So my name is Baptiste. Uh, I'm very glad to be here to present our work on uh, audiovisual active speaker detection on embedded devices. So uh, first, what is audiovisual active speaker detection? So it is a task of detecting who is speaking in a video by using both audio and visual uh, modalities. So in this video, for example, uh, it's very simple. Uh, speakers are in red, uh, in green, <laughs> and non-speakers are in red. Um, so what for? Uh, there are plenty of use cases, but mainly in for speaker dialogization, uh, speech enhancement also. And in our, ca in our case, we are addressing um, video retargeting for video conferencing systems. So uh, actually for humans, it's quite easy to, do, to, to see if someone is speaking or not, but for a machine, it's much more difficult. Uh, actually, uh, this scene can illustrate the challenges. So first, uh, in this scene, you have plenty of potential speakers. Uh, and sometimes the resolution may be too low for the algorithm to see on the lips, if the lips are moving or not. So uh, especially on embedded devices, most of the time you have uh, <coughs> not a 4K resolution. Um, the second challenge lies in the audio and it's called the multi-speaker scenario. So um, imagine that someone is speaking in this scene. Uh, so the audio segment will contain speech, but the machine learning algorithm will associate this speech to all the individuals in the scene. So we'll associate potential speech with, with non-speakers. So this makes a lot of ambiguity into the learning process. So usually state-of-the-art models are solving this problem by uh, building big, big networks that uh, with the learning process are a bit uh, erasing this kind of uh, problems. But in our case, we want to embed the solution on, a, on a hardware, so it's uh, difficult to build big models. So uh, we want to port the models on uh, NXP hardware that go from M MPU to MCU. Um, and in particular, we will uh, first uh, port on IN NXP NPU because, as I said, it can be a big model, so we are taking an IN platform for it with Cortex A and a machine learning uh, neural network accelerator. Um, then we want to port the model on MCU, so we are targeting the uh, IMX RT1170 with Cortex M7 and 1 GHz. And our end goal will be to address the MCX N series, which is a MCU with a neural uh, network accelerator. So this is um, our setup for this work. So basically, we are developing the model on PyTorch or TensorFlow using a single, single GPU. And then we are porting the model using uh, TF Lite Micro for the MCU and TF Lite for the MPU. We are using quantization for the MCU, but also to run the model on the NPU. So uh, what is the model uh, neural network about? Uh, it is a two branch model, one branch per modality, which is quite common for a multimodal architecture. And uh, what is an embedding network? So basically it's a network which duty is to transform the input data into a vector. So uh, basically we can just use uh, stacked convolutions. So everything works. Um, once we have these vectors, we need to fuse it. Okay, so in this fusion blocks. So uh, actually, uh, the fusion looks like that. So you can read this slide bottom to top. Um, we are feeding video and audio embeddings to sequential layers. The hidden state of the sequential layers can be combined into multimodal embeddings. 
uh, usually using concatenation, but we can use addition too. Then we use on top of the multiple, on top of the fusion, we can use another sequential layer, and then there is the fully connected for the classification. Okay, so this is a basic example of what the fusion looks like. So it's a big name for something which is actually quite simple. Um, knowing that the sequential layer are optional, so we can use sequential layer only for the after the multimodal uh, fusion, only for the video embeddings, or only for the audio, or two out of three, or everything is free. Uh, to train the model, we are using uh, the AVA Active Speaker dataset, which is uh, basically the best dataset to me for this task. Uh, it's a collection of movies uh, from different countries with different languages and uh, with different resolutions too. Um, from this data set, we can use uh, video-based labels, which, uh, so it's very simple. Uh, if someone is speaking, the label is equal to one. If someone is not, the label is equal to zero. But we are also defining an audio-based label, uh, which is quite a voice activity detection. If someone is speaking, uh, at least in the frame, the label is equal to one. And if no one is speaking, the label is equal to zero for every individual. So defining two kind of uh, label helps for um, helps to disentangle the multi-speaker scenario actually. Okay. Um, so using this label, we can define the losses. So the main losses is uh, the multimodal one using the video label, but we also leverage uh, auxiliary classifiers. So one for the video branch and one for the audio branch. Uh, and as you can see, the loss for the audio auxiliary classifier is uh, the audio label. So we have multiple uh, losses. We need to combine it. So we are using a linear combination to combine the three losses. And we are training the model in end to end. So now we have the building blocks. The idea is to define a very efficient architecture um, from it and we want to do neural architecture search. So the biggest task uh, doing neural architecture search is to define the search space, and it's very a key point in this presentation, the central po point of this presentation, because actually uh, defining the search space uh, is a key. <laughs> so uh, the goal is to limit the training time because dealing with video and audio can lead to very long trainings. Um, and also we need to check by defining the layers and the tool we want in our NAS that every layer is compatible with the whole pipeline, so compati compatible with uh, TF Lite, TF Lite Micro, and uh, that everything is running fine uh, in real time. So uh, our metrics here are the response time for one phase on both uh, MPU and MCU. Uh, we also define uh, our key metric here is the area under the curve, um, under the rock curve. So uh, I will talk about that, this metric uh, as accuracy because it's more simple to say. But basically, uh, rock curve, uh, area under the cur curve is measuring the, the um, compromise between, between true positive rate and false positive rate by taking the area uh, behind the curve. Um, and we can check the number of parameters and the number of multiple accumulates too. So uh, we did uh, the selection of the operators as an ablation study starting from this model, uh, which is already quite small with two million of parameters. So you can see this line is quite is blank because we did not in, uh, port this model into the hardware because it features a uh, bidirectional groove, and we want our model to run in real time, so it is not suited. It also uses uh, concatenation-based fusion and uh, high-resolution input features with uh, this kind of uh, features. So uh, we can make a nicer baseline, just uh, removing the bidirectional groove. Oh, sorry. B Removing the bidirectional groove and just uh, using simple uh, groove. So you can see the model is uh, very slow yet, running for each inference on CPU at 300 milliseconds, for example. 
um, and this change is we are losing a bit of accuracy with this change. So this is a very, very big model and we want to reduce the computational cost of it. First change we can do, so it's a very, very minor change, but still uh, it can be relevant. It's just replacing the concatenation of the features with an addition. Uh, then, so a very famous change, which uh, I could have put it in, at, in the top, is uh, replacing the standard uh, convolution with depth-wise separable convolution. So as you can see, it's reduced a lot the computational cost of the model. So this is very important. Uh, we can further uh, modify the temporal uh, sequential layers by replacing the group by a temporal convolutional networks. So th for the ones that are um, uh, used to use TCN, you can notice that this structure of TCN is quite particular and adapted to the multimodal setup. Um, so then one, uh, the second big change after the depth-wise separable convolution is to uh, use lower resolution as uh, data. So we're using less context for the audio and uh, smaller face crops. So something I need to stress here is that we are using MFCC for the audio uh, with 13 coefficients, uh, 13 coefficients, yes. Um, that's it. So uh, the trend here is that we improve the computational cost of the model but the accuracy is uh, lower with all this change. So we still need, uh, so two big changes that we will keep for all the experimentation is uh, the depth-wise separable convolution and the lower resolution uh, input feature because uh, this is key to build a smaller model. Um, but still we don't know what is the best configuration because we are not sure about using GRU or using TCN how many layers of GRU, uh, what kind of kernels we want to use, uh, what is the dimension of the hidden state, all this kind of hyperparameter we are not sure about. So we will define that using uh, the NAS. So now we have the source state we can perform to the search. Um, so starting from a PyTorch model, uh, we develop, a new, well, we convert it into TensorFlow, uh, convert it again into TensorFlow lights. Then we uh, okay, we do post-training quantization, so uh, in uh, eight bits, so we can port it on every devices, uh, and then on each de device we perform a benchmark, so we have a criteria to uh, loop our search algorithm. Uh, actually, what is this criteria about? We use ASHA scheduler, which is an early stopping based uh, scheduler. The idea is that when we benchmark the model on the device, we can check if the response time is, uh, is good and if the accuracy is good too. And if it's not good, we are just stopping the experimentation very early. So it accelerates the, the search. So the, the whole pipeline actually is automized, so meaning that to port on the, on the target, uh, flashing the board is automized, uh, compiling, everything is uh, running automatically, so it goes very fast. So uh, let's talk about the results. So this is uh, about the MCU results. So let's focus on the left scatter plot first. So each point is a model, obviously. What you can see is that the models that do not feature any sequential layers are the worst ones, so the gray ones, in terms of accuracy. Uh, the GRU-based model has the best one in terms of accuracy, but the TCN-based ones are the fastest one. On the right scatter plot, you can see that the response time is linear, linearly co correlated to the multiple accumulates, which is expected. Uh, what you can see is that the number of parameters in learned, uh, is not related to the response time most of the time. So uh, out of every model, we are choosing uh, one model to, to work with. So this was the most efficient one for us because it's the most, uh, is, 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 it is the most uh, accurate and <coughs> also quite uh, fast in terms of infer inference. Um, so for NPU now, so we have the, kind, the same plots. Uh, the same trend is observed uh, on the left. So we are choosing the same model, which is the most uh, 
accurate one again. On the right, you can see that the response time is no more uh, linear with respect to the multiple accumulates. Uh, so the, uh, we did not dig into that uh, too much, but we think it's about the, that the calculus are so fast, it depends more on the data loads. Um, yeah. So uh, let's compare this, uh, the selected model to the state of the art. So we can see uh, on the top charts the difference in, in terms of accuracy. But let's focus on the bottom charts. So the bottom left chart is uh, comparing the results by evolving the number of faces in the scene. So basically it illustrates the complexity of the multi-speaker scenario. And you can see that you are we are losing performances when uh, we add up speakers in the scene. Um, on the right, you can see uh, a similar experiments, but by lowering the, the resolution of the faces. So you can see by, uh, that the lower the resolution, the lower the accuracy. Um, so here uh, we want to target real time. So uh, the red uh, line here is 25 frames per second. Everything that is above this line is good. Everything that is below this line is bad. Uh, what you can see on the left uh, uh, plot is that for uh, everything that is related to MPU, so the orange and the blue curve, it's running very fast, uh, very fine, until like 40 faces or even more. So it's good. It's more difficult for the MCU solution. Uh, it just under fewer faces. Uh, on the right, you can see that for M uh, we uh, underclocked the CPU frequency of the MCU to check what is the trend uh, with lower frequency. And you can see that for one phase, you can go up to 300 uh, megahertz, but it's quite difficult to, to go into this, uh, this uh, kind of frequency range. And for multiple phases, it's very difficult to run. Um, So uh, as a conclusion, the MPU is yet fully adapted to the requirements, especially because uh, I just talked about the model itself, but actually the integration pipeline is much more difficult because we have to deal with buffers, we have to deal with cropping the faces, computing the input features. So uh, this is the pipeline for four faces, for example. Um, for the MCU, it's much more difficult. So we can use algorithm for very few phases. So it can be adapted to, uh, let's say, some use cases, but yet it's difficult. So I'm looking forward using uh, the incoming uh, MCXN, which is MCU with MPU, as we saw that running on NPU was helping a lot. So if you want to learn more about NXP and machine learning, there are some links there. And uh, especially there is the AIQ toolkit, which is good to enable machine learning on uh, NXP hardware. So that's it, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>